Hello and welcome to July's episode of For Your Consideration with me, Luke, and my co-host, as ever, Michael. Me, Michael. Hello. 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 Why am I and moving? We, we are recording this on Midsummer's Day, uh, so not that long before it comes out, and the night before the final episode of the current season of Doctor Who. It's and, in three and a half hours. Uh, yes. I have finally watched the Christmas special, uh, Church on Ruby Road, which mm. I enjoyed more than I expected to, um, but I still haven't seen any of the rest of the series. Um, right. But I have discovered who the big bad is. It's impossible to avoid. Um, yes. What spoiled it was seeing the thumbnail for the latest Radio Free Scar episode, which has little details at the bottom of the thumbnail as to yeah. what, what's, what it's about. And I was like, oh, okay, well, never mind. Um, yeah, but let's blame Radio Free Scar or, yeah, blame Canada. Blame I mean, I would, to be fair, like the BBC Doctor Who uh, YouTube channel has also been posting clips, so I would have yeah. seen it on that. Um, and BBC4 showed it last night. Showed Pyramids of Mars. Oh, showed Pyramids of Mars, did it? Oh, well, okay. they showed a special George Lucasified oh, version. The the Tales of the Tardis with the with the hand of yeah. Sutek. No, the bum hand. What is it? The bum hand of Sutek removed. Yeah. <laughs> it was. I was always always like the thought of it as the, the cushion holder. Of the Sutek, cushion holder of Sutek. But yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yes, but tonight. So my pick this month is Dirk Gently, um, specifically the 2010 pilot and the 2012 series of three that followed. The Mangan um, on version. BB, BB, on BBC Four, um, Stephen Mangan as Dirk Gently, Darren Boyd as Richard McDuff, made by ITV Studios but shown on BBC Four, um, just to be confusing. Um, so that's that's the pick, but obviously we really need to talk about Douglas Adams because yes. he wrote the book, uh, books on which this series is very loosely based. Um, uh and obviously that that goes back to Doctor Who and Hitchhikers. So I will start by asking you, Michael, because okay. you're a bit older than me. Where did you first encounter the works of Douglas Adams? Okay, uh, right. Let's do this in actual order and then order of passion. Okay, so anyone who's my age will instantly go, "Yes, I experienced it on Radio Four first. That's <laughs> nonsense, right? It's absolute nonsense." Most people actually my age experienced it on TV with the um, the Zephod Two Heads, the perfect Marvin, the um, the brilliant... I, I loved it, right? That was the TV version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Then I discovered that my mother's cousin, who's considerably older than me, had actually taped it off Radio 4, and he promised me the tapes. Uh, I never got them. I never got them for right. 15 years when he finally went, oh yeah, I promised you these. I was like, fine. Anyway, he did say he had the original tapes off the radio for, as he recorded them live on the night of broadcast, because it was called something sci-fi, so he taped it. Um, anyway, so my experience was that, but my primary source of Adam's material is the four-disc LP version. Oh, Okay. Uh, and that is one I played literally to death. Now, I went to visit my parents a few weeks ago and um, had a bit of a clear out. I hit the vinyl section, my old vinyl collection, because we now have a record player here at our house, and I brought it home. I still have the original 1978 or 79, I think it might be 79, album, which I literally played to death. Now, so, so, there, do, so how is that different sorry, yeah. from the radio series? Uh, the song, the music's wrong, uh, like oh, right. being done again because there, there's right. no Pink Floyd stuff like that, and it's all. But I, ca if you get me drunk enough, I can do it all. And the voices, Benji Mouse and Frankie Mouse, sound better. Um, it's just got more polish to it. I right. just love the album version. Right. That's that's my primary one. Obviously, after that, we've then got the novels, uh, which I adored and loved and have signed copies of. Um, and I did have a first edition of the hardback, but the hardback post dates the first edition of the paperback. Uh, so it's not worth as much as you would think, which I then sold because I was skinned. But that one wasn't signed. If it had been signed, it wouldn't have left my house. Right. Um, I also had later on the VHS. I then bought when they finally released them and got copyright clearance from Pink Floyd. Thanks. Um, I got the CDs. Yeah, uh, from the BBC shop, which was a great thing. The BBC shop, 
um, in Newcastle. And have, you got, have you got the Have you got the set where the this there's six CDs and each of them has a, an entry on the back and you can slot it into the window at the front? No, I've got the first, so the basic... the first oh, okay. release, which is a rock-hard cardboard case. Oh, okay, right. And uh, six discs, and they were printed on what looks like foil that you would get from a very cheap art shop. Oh, I so I listened to the tape cassette version mm. that was the same yeah. cover as those. Yeah, 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 okay. Mm. Uh, let me see. So then, there's that. Uh, beyond that, I I just I just loved Adams's work. One of my pieces of reading it because we used to do an oral exam in in uh, school where you had to right. read from a book. Uh, course, I just well, actually no, that's a lie. What I did for my GCSE drama, for which I got an A plus for, was right. my did the monologue from the opening of the book. Right. Okay. Right. That was it. Because I had had the album. I didn't even need to learn it. I just opened my mouth and it came out. Did, were you doing an impression of Peter Jones, or were you? No, doing I was. It as I was you? doing. I was doing me as the book, but it was. Right. It had okay, Peter yeah. Jonesiness about it, but right. they weren't yeah. to know that. It wasn't a flat. I can't do Peter Jones. I can sound relaxing and calming and cool and all that, but I'm not. Yeah. I can. If I really layer it on, I can be yeah. almost book-like. Right. But yeah, it's a performance. Yeah. Um, Peter Jones was just so, doing Peter Jones okay. and not understanding it. So yeah, basically I've immersed myself in Douglas Adams. My first girlfriend and I, like, we bonded over the fact that, um, like, the the thing she liked about me the, it, early on was, was that I right. knew The Hitchhiker's Guide inside and out. Right. Which, you know, obviously, as far as I'm concerned, gets you very high vote marks in my eyes. So yeah, it's always been there. Always. So, oh, okay, so what about Doctor Who? Were you aware uh, that he'd written for Doctor Who? To be fair, I was I was unaware that... I knew The City of Death was one of my favourite stories, but I hadn't put two and two together at all. Because it's I was not credited unaware. to him. No, exactly, so I didn't know. Right. Um, I didn't know Pirate Planet. Well, no, I I think I might have gone, oh, yeah, he did Pirate Planet, but discovered it years later. I was going to say, how old were you in 1978? Six. So you would have been very early stages yeah, of Doctor yeah. Who. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My first yeah. memories of... I, I can remember that story, because I remember the parrot. I loved the parrot. I loved K9. Uh, so, yeah, th- th- that was early on. I've got flashes okay. of that. I was unaware that Adams had done the, du- the stuff for years. But when I was reading book four of The Hitchhiker's Guide, I was like, this is... Bits of this are familiar. And then I started putting two in two together that I'd come across Doctor Who people were talking about other I didn't have any other friends who were into Doctor Who right so I was finding everything out for myself no one was coming along going oh yeah you know I didn't have some ancient mentor going oh yeah this this is exist so right you know what I mean there there was just like I discovered stuff for myself randomly right like reading Doctor Who magazine and things like that okay so I knew I was a giant Douglas Adams fan and I was unaware of of his other stuff Right. Uh, of, Interesting. Of like, yeah. So, and like, I, I didn't find uh, the meaning of Liff for years later. But... I've never read that. I'm aware of it because it's always if you look in the front of like any Douglas Adams book, it's it's like mm. other things by Douglas Adams, and I'm like, well, yeah. I've read Hitchhikers and I've read Dirt Gently, but I've not read. Yeah. I've not read Last Chance to See or the Meaning of Liff. Yeah. Or the deeper meaning of Liff. Um, well, that's that's cool. the John Lloyd connection, isn't it? Where yes. you've got because um, because he did the the because John Lloyd did the Hagi Memnons. <laughs> Which is why they were written out, because Douglas wanted full control of the narrative, so that he'd written everything. I hadn't really thought about that because I know those those the last two episodes of yeah the first series are co co written with John Lloyd, aren't they? Yeah, and that and the primary bits of that the John Lloydness are the, are, the are, are, are are removed by Adams, and uh... hot, hot black ships expanded. Because I, pref- I prefer the Hagging Anons to yeah. Disaster Area. Yeah. Well, Personally. I'd, yeah. You know that I made showed you the handmade the Red Dwarf t-shirt a few weeks ago? Yeah. At the same time, I also made a handmade Disaster Area t-shirt right. as well. Because cause that's the kind of fan I was, like you said. So I thought t-shirts were the way to go. Yeah, and perhaps yeah. I should have followed that. But anyway, um, so yeah, it was the sort of thing I would do. It was just always there in my head. The, the album was played to death. I put it onto tape. I would have it on my Walkman all the time. Okay. I, it was it was just, a th- it was my go-to calming place. It really was. It still is. So, it can be, yeah. So when did you first read the novel of the novels of Dirk Gently? Uh, oh, I read the, the Dirk Gently novels on release. 
because oh, okay. by in that in, point in the late 80s yeah. okay yeah right. well i was working in uh, it was when i first started working in the book no was i working in the bookshop yes i must have been working in the bookshop let me see what what is it 87 the book 87 and 88 yeah so what 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 year am i that's am i am i i'm 16 at that point no no i'm, I'm about to start working in the book trade for my saturday job so yeah. I think, oh, hang on, memories, memories cheating. I bought them from Waterstones uh, on release because yeah. I managed to blag the display case from the shop owner. Wow, okay. And I still have the cardboard cutout that says Dirk Gently Solistic Detective Agency, the brass plaque. Really? Was, was, yeah, I have it wow. inside my illustrated Hitchhiker's Guide like, to keep it flat. I also have an Arkham Asylum one as well for my for my claim that I think I was working in the book trade when Long Dark Tea Time comes out in hardback. But Dirk Gently, I think I bought from Waterstones rather than working in Dylan's, which is where I was working the second time. There we go. Cool. Because I spent ten years working in the book trade, which I bloody loved. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah. So so Adams has always been yeah, there in right. your okay. in your life. Shall we shall we get my embarrassing Adams story out the way? If you want to. Oh, you don't have to share yeah. your embarrassing Adam's story. Yeah, right? well, please, I do. Please right. do okay. if you feel like Okay, it. this story is... Okay, there's a guy called Steve Savile who is a very good friend of mine and was at the time. And he uh, is an author. He's an author. Quite, an, quite a very successful one, to be honest, if you look him up. Uh, he's a thriller writer and a horror writer and he does shed loads. You can, you can find him at some point. But anyway, he now lives in... I think it's Norway. Or is it Sweden? I always get confused where he lives now. But... That's where he's living there. But at the time, he came with me and joined the queue to meet Douglas Adams. And I'd forgotten all about this. I knew I had a signed selection of practically everything by him. And it was all signed at this one event in Waterstones. And he was signing Last Chance to See. So I brought everything with me. I was the annoying twatty fan. Right. I really was. It was the worst behaved I'd ever been. Right. I had everything. I had the four books in one, Hitchhiker's Guide. I had the radio scripts. Yeah. I had um, the CDs. And I had my Dirk Gentleys. Okay. That wasn't everything, right. but it felt like everything. I had a big bag because normally I would take six things. Pure, poor Terry Pratchett. He had 40 odd books at the end and people were bringing them all to get signed. That's why he had the hand thing. Anyway, so Douglas was... was com- right. So we get to the front of the queue after a very, very long wait. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and he's and he's just as happy and as nice and as massively tall as ever. And he said to me, "Why do people want all of these signed now?" Okay, from my point of view, speaking now, fifty-two-year-old me. Oh, sorry, Steve reminded me of the story two years ago. Fifty-year-old me. I was about to sell my unsigned copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide hardback on Twitter. I, I like said, out, I'm, "I'm selling this." Does you know? Does anyone want it? And Steve messaged me and he reminded me of this story. This story is so embarrassing that I'd blocked it from my memory until he <laughs> reminded me. I can so sort Doug- of vaguely guess where this is going. Yeah, so Douglas says to me, according to Steve, and I agree with him because I've remembered it now, why does everyone want these signed? And I said to my absolute literary hero, you'll be dead one day and these will be worth something. And he pissed himself laughing. I made Douglas Adams laugh, which I'm happy about. He's dead now. I'm deeply upset. I regret saying those words for my entire life. That is my embarrassing Douglas oh Adams story. Oh, Michael. Oh, I, I was, wow. I was okay. like, I, I, I haven't even got the excuse of being too young. I think I was 20. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't an arrogant twat. I wasn't. No. I was a very boring child. I was. I was a dull geek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know what to say or do, but that is word for word what I said. And I was so upset by this, by what I'd done. I think Steve took took the piss for a good hour in the pub afterwards. Um, that I I blocked it. I loved all of the signed stuff that I've got, but I blocked that memory until he reminded me, and then I went, "Oh, oh shit, that's true." That's what I did. I did that. I'm an idiot. So anyway, that is me and Douglas Adams. But you made him laugh. So, I made you know, him laugh. It... I made my literary hero laugh. I've never thought about it like that until right now because it's just me racked with a huge amount of embarrassment guilt. 
Uh, yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Right. So so that's that. And then obviously there's the Hitchhiker's movie, which I've got love hate relationship with. Um, there's the Dirk Mags audio versions of all of the books that yeah. I'm very impressed with, and I've got very strong connections with, despite the fact that so many people have had to be recast because they're no longer with us. Yeah. Um, I think they were onto their fourth book in the end. <laughs> uh, but yeah. That's uh, fine. Yes, because William Franklin died. Yeah. After doing the first, well, the sixth one doesn't exist, you know, because it's not Douglas Adams. I pretend it's that not, the sixth, yep, I pretend that the sixth fine. one doesn't exist. Although um, the ending of the audio fixes everything so much better than the ending of the novel, which I've just finished rereading because I couldn't remember the end. So the ending right, of the okay. audio version is much better. Are we um, talking about the end of the? F- the end of the book. sixth. Oh, the end of the sixth book. Okay. The end of the sixth audio adaptation of the book that you don't doesn't right. think exists fixes. The, ex- the existence of the fifth book and the ending, no, the ending of the fifth and the ending of the sixth as well. It fixes the problems in a lovely, fanny way. Okay. Because yeah, I know the, the, yeah. the ending of the fifth series has that yes. ten minute coda that kind of wraps it all up. And I was just like, well, yeah. you don't need to do anything more with this. And then obviously yeah. they brought out the sixth novel and then they adapted the sixth novel. And yeah. I, I think I listened to like half of the first radio episode of that. I yeah. was just like, nope, I am done. This is yeah. not for me. That's not for you, no. That's fine, and things should not be for you. Okay, so that is it. Basically, at some point during this experience, I was going to suggest The Hitchhikers again. Then I realised, no, we both love it. What's the point of like, hey, I would like to introduce you to this. You don't think I already know about it? So what's the point? Because this is for your consideration. We're introducing new projects to people, stuff that people might not know. And I think as the, the single most Doctor Who adjacent thing in the world is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right, so that's me. That's you, yes. That, I yes. guess uh, it's my turn. And uh, to be honest, I can't fully remember the order of everything and what I became aware of when. But I yeah, think I, was, I first, would be very surprised if you could. But I think the I think the first piece of Douglas Adams stuff that I did actually consume would have been Pirate Planet, um, because um, obviously I was sporadically collecting VHSs throughout the nineties. But the key to time came out in pretty rapid succession. Um, on VHS, yes, it, yes. Yes, on VHS. And it's still one of the only Doctor Who seasons from Classic Who that I watched in order. Right. Because it, you know, but, and obviously because it has the arc, you know. Hmm. Um, so I would have seen Pirate Planet in that. And I, I, and I, I just, I don't recall what I was aware of. I think I was aware that there was this guy called Douglas Adams who had written this thing called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I didn't listen to Hitchhikers until I was 16 or 17. And I know that for a fact because my brother um, borrowed the tape. Well, he must have heard it at uni and he borrowed the tapes off a friend. And it was those, like you say, the silver foil ones. Yeah. So he came home from uni and and lent me those, um, which was obviously, yeah, six cassette tapes with all 12 original episodes. So I would have listened Mm. to that, like I say, when I was 17, 16, 17 before I went to uni myself. Um and where and I think again he came across the book of Dirk Gently and would have read that and then again lent it to me. But again, where in the whole shebang I don't know. Yeah. And I don't recall I wonder whether because I so I have the hardback omnibus. I don't think I read the second novel till I got this. And I don't remember when I got that. Mm. Um so anyway. Um and then I guess, yeah, I must have seen City of Death at some point, and I was, I guess, vaguely aware that he was script editor of season 17. Yeah. Um, and it took me a very long time to get around to the books of Hitchhiker. Because mm. um, yeah. I think, in fact, yeah, no, I know this for a fact. So I'd listened to the radio series, then obviously the Dirk Mags adaptations of 3, 4, and 5 happened while I was at uni. Got you, and I, yeah. And I have a very distinct memory of s- stacking up some books, balancing my DAB radio on top of them because DAB reception in Sunderland was a bit crap. Yep. And I wanted a proper crisp digital stereo recording of the episodes. <laughs> yeah. So and I, and it and it was it, it with with one episode at least it was so bad that I couldn't be in the room. <laughs> so I basically had I basically had I had you were a conductor of radio energy. 
Well, yeah, so I don't know what it was, but the, the so the cable was coming out the back of the DB radio, Ray radio into my mini disc player. I recorded yep. them onto mini disc. So I basically. I also have a mini disc recorder somewhere. Yeah. So I was, I was listening to Radio 4, press record, left the room for half an hour, came yep. back, and then listened to my recording that I had that I had made. That is glorious. I mean, obviously, I then bought the CDs because the CDs were kind of extended. Particularly yeah. with the particularly with the fourth and fifth books because they were they were only given four episodes each rather than six episodes each so there was a lot of material that got left out. Um, so I I basically listened to the radio, original radio series, listened to the adaptation of the books, and was like, mm. "Hang on, why is Arthur Dent back on prehistoric Earth again?" <clears throat> and obviously, yeah. it's because Douglas Adams reworked the order of things when he novelised the second book. Yeah. Um, and then I must have read the books at some point. Um. But I, I, well, I always prefer those original two radio series of Hitchhiker to yeah anyth- anything else. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, the movie came out in my final year of uni, um, so I, I watched that, and I, I like it a lot more than most people seem to. I was, it- uh, I got tickets from the Disney store. I think, uh, I do, I don't know where I got them from. Possibly SFX for the premiere. So there, there was like a premiere showing in okay. God knows which cinema it was. I couldn't tell you which one it was. But I remember going to it and going, yeah, I was enjoy. I think it, the only issues, the issues I had were uh, Zephod's heads. I, I don't think oh, okay. I could make it. I don't think I could make it past that. I could even, I, ah, now there was a Comic-Con. So it must have been the same time I was really into Buffy because there was a friend of mine who I cannot remember the name of. And she was at one of the Buffy con- cons and she was going to the Milton Keynes convention. And I got a photograph of M- Marvin from the internet because there was nothing official available, but there'd been some leaked photographs. Yeah, yeah. And I managed to print it on high quality card and I got Warwick Davis to sign it. Right. So, and apparently it was the first thing of Marvin that Warwick had signed. <laughs> Wow. Because nobody had done that. And then they, I got posted that in the post. So I've not met Warwick. I've just got Warwick's autograph on a Marvin picture. Right. Nice. So, which I think predates me even seeing the film because I got all excited. But why they didn't get Mar- why they didn't get Warwick to voice Marvin is in- weird because I think he could have really pulled it off quite well. And I know they got Alan Rickman, but that I think that's, he's too starry. I, if I was doing it now I, with the same cast, I probably would have gone for Alan Rickman as Slotty Bardfast. He could have done a brilliant Zephod, but I, that's not because Alan was, you know, a, a much. You're right. Alan, Alan Rickman could have done Slotty Bardfast, I and mean, obviously Bill Nye is a, 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 an amazing Slotty Bardfast. Yes, he is. But I think that I think the problem is that Alan Rickman, although his voice is very good and distinctive, yeah, Stephen Moore is just. Definitively, yeah. Martin, you can't, Marvin. You cannot be like, Stephen Moore. You yeah, you can't have all. anybody other than Stephen Moore in that role. Although um, although Dirk Mag's recast was inspired. Did he? Oh, I, I guess he uh, had to recast for yeah for the most recent series. Yeah, and it's brilliant. Um, okay, it's it's oh bollocks. The, oh dear, he said, trying to remember who it was. Oh, he's incredibly famous. The actor. Oh right, okay. Uh, well. Um, and we'll look that up hype. later. Yeah, we'll look it up later. Anyway, that's not important. It, um, if this was anyway, YouTube, yeah, it would be a bottom yeah. screen. Right. So, so anyway, right? Somewhere yes. in the mix. Somewhere in the mix, I read Dirk Gently. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm again. It's one of these things of like I'm pretty certain I was aware of City of Death or had seen City of Death before Dirk Gently, and I was aware of Sharda, even though, uh, and the webcast of Sharda happened while I was a student again. So. I, that that's was the my, one with Paul McGann, yeah. That's the one with Paul McGann with the really yeah. dodgy flash animation. Hang on, right? Okay, hang on. I've got a phrase. Sharda is the least missing of the missing Doctor Who stories. Yes, it is. It's been made so many times. So, so I think I must have known what all the big answers are. Because I mean, okay. I think mm-hmm. before we go for any further, I think we just have to say spoilers ahoy. Okay. Yes. Because we can't really discuss the plot. And we can't discuss the adaptation and what's different or not without basically kind of talking about the major plot points. Yeah, I think so, I think we're on safe ground because a yes. time has passed considerably, yeah, 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 yeah. and the sort of people who listen to us have done this. They, well, this is what I think. This is what I think. They're, but, they're going but, to be a but, lot safer with this than we are with yes. some of the other stuff. But I'm we'll just I'm up. just going to say at this point, if you haven't read Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, stop yeah. listening now. Yes. And don't come back until you've read it. Yeah. 
and then obviously and... watch the TV series. Watch the TV series because we're going to be talking about that too. Yeah. Um. Um. So that's yes. Spoilers ahoy. So okay. So I was aware. I think I must have been aware that Dirk Gently borrowed the whole explosion of alien spacecraft starts life on Earth thing. Yeah. And obviously, I knew that Professor Cronotus's secret was his. He was from his Dallas rooms are a time a time machine. Yeah. You know, those are the kind of those are the kind of big things from Doctor Who that get put into Dirk yeah. Gently. And it's not a TARDIS. It's a doorway. It's a doorway. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, and I just and it, and it's one of those things where there's so much going on in the book. Yeah, you know, there's all these details, and and that they do all interconnect. Like I think I didn't really fully get the whole sofa thing when I first read it. I've actually written that in my notes. Um, what well, the things that are missing in the pilot? Well, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah. time machine but and it, sofa. Yeah, but I think when I first read the book, yeah. I still wasn't sure what was going on with the because it's just it's it's just one line of like mm-hmm. we've yeah. dropped here and we've opened the door and the guys have come up with and it, if you don't pay attention at that point in the book you miss how the safe yeah. got where it is and then it Definitely. wasn't until I read it this, read it the second or third time I was like oh yeah okay right it makes sense now um, so yeah so there's all that and it and I suppose sort of leaping to the TV adaptation briefly here yes it's all the Doctor Who stuff that's missing from yes. the TV version, right? There's none yes. of that. There's none of that that makes the transition to the TV version. N- necessarily, I think. Um, and I think Because Doctor thing, Who had been back a year. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think it was necessarily that. I just think that the... Well, here's the, th- here's the, here's the thing. So for me, yeah. the two big differences between the novels and the TV adaptation, and you can mm. chime in on this or not. Okay. Both books are about a big concept, right? So the okay. first book is alien spacecraft explodes, imbues energy into stuff, it kicks off evolution of life on Earth. Yes. As it happens in City of Death, right? So there's that big idea. And then there's also the idea of ghosts exist, right? Because the, the ghost that survived the millennia... Yes. To possess the guy. And then there's the ghost of Gordon Way, right? So there's there's a sort of supernatural element to it. And then obviously in the second book you've got the Norse gods are real. Because yeah. humans invented them and brought them into existence by their belief, essentially, right? So there's Yeah. Which is kind those... of also a big Neil Gaiman concept in, yeah. in various other things as well. Yeah. So so and and none of that makes it into the T V show. No, right. there's no big world-shaking stuff that's going on. They're, they're they're much smaller stories that revolve around Dirk and Richard. Yeah, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily. I'm just saying that's for me that's one of the biggest differences between the two. Yeah. The other difference, and you can tell me how how much you think I'm right about this as well, is that TV Dirk is not book Dirk. No, and TV Dirk is much less likable than book Dirk. Ah, now the likability I've actually put in my notes because I wanted to discuss that. Okay. Okay, so let's deal with physicality. Um, okay, so there's the Harry Enfield adaptation on audio, yeah. which yeah. is a lot closer to the book. Okay, we yeah. might as well say that they're straight and, adaptations. And I and I somehow missed that. I think because I wasn't living in the UK at the time. That would make sense. Well, um, you can buy them yeah. both uh, as a as a box set from Amazon or Audible for like twelve quid or something. Okay, I um, might have to do that eventually. Yeah, um, right. Now I I think I've got them on CD somewhere, but I haven't encoded them to MP3, so that's fine. But anyway, so they exist. Now Harry Enf. Okay, so the f- description in the book is curly hair, fat, red fedora, trench coat. Okay, like he's playing the he's almost cosplaying. Is it? I thought it was a beret. Oh. I thought he wears a beret. Oh, I'm, hang on. I, Either I'm way, there's a there's an inappropriate hat. There's there's a hat. There's a hat that makes him look stupid. Yeah. He, yes. He wears he wears a trench coat and he's tubby. Yeah. The the tubbiness. I was quite. I could. Well, let's face it. I could relate to that, and it's nice <laughs> to see yourself on the screen. Okay. So that was it. I mean, regardless of whether I am tubby or not, I felt yeah, it yeah. at the time. So that was that was where I was at. So I was like, yay, you know, portly, yeah, yeah, yeah. portly investigator. That's fine. 
But you're right. Now, is he only likable? And I've thought about this a lot with narrative in general and writing. Are characters only likable because you're in the, the narrative with them and you want to like them? Well, so I had a thought about this. And, and, I, there's, and this is the big difference in, the, in how the two books are narrated. Okay. So the first book is primarily told through the eyes of Richard and the ghost of Gordon Way. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, you get a lot more kind of internal monologue, well, internal yes. kind of picture. There's a little, there's a scene where Dirk goes to Richard's flat and bumps into Jilks, which is written from Dirk's point of view. Mm. But I think most of the first novel is not from Dirk's point of view. He's a character in the novel that you experience through other people, and that is standard for detective. That is standard novel. The yeah. second novel is sort of jointly told from Dirk's perspective and Kate's perspective. They they're the two main characters in the second novel. Yeah. So you get to know a lot more about what Dirk's doing and thinking and, you know, because he's, he's the way into the... Well, the Kate's the way in and Dirk's the way in. There's a key moment mm. in the... if I mean, in terms of, like, moments from the book that make it into the TV, they think this is a key one that highlights the differences between the two people. So Dirk hypnotises Richard, yes. right? So in the in the book, that's to find out what happened at the the Cambridge College the night before, because he wants yeah. to kind of hypnotise him to kind of bring out all the details that he wouldn't necessarily be able to tell him, and he plants the post hypnotic suggestion to jump into the canal and yes and tread water right yep yeah. until Dirk comes and, and rescues him right um and that's obviously that's a funny joke like he didn't need to do that. He's, it's slightly mean, but he's also testing out this hypothesis of Richard was acting under the influence of the ghost when he climbed into the flat to er- erase the yeah. answer phone messages. Okay, so there's a sort of so he's a, working out how suggestible he truly is. Yeah, he's working out how, he's working that out, and so it is a bit mean to get him to jump into the to to strip naked, jump into the canal, and not be able to swim. Okay, that's a little yes. bit mean. Okay, but it had a point, and it is a bit funny, and he's he's on hand with the towel. You know, he's prepared, right? That same scene in the TV version, Dirk yeah. p- plants the post-hypnotic suggestion for Richard to invest tens of thousands of pounds in his business. Yes. And that is a lot more mean. Yes. And then and then because the TV show sets up Macduff as his partner rather than just his friend who the first novel's about, because obviously yeah. Richard, Macduff disappears after the first book, mm-hmm. whereas in this it's like we're going to make the buddy cop detective yeah. thing. He then becomes like the put upon assistant who Dirk is constantly mean to throughout the rest of the the series. Yes. So I yes, think that's, that's the big that's the big difference between the two is that I like book Dirk even though he's capable of being, you know, a bit of a git occasionally, but he's generally likable whereas TV Dirk is just a bit of a git. I think I think it comes down to something that I spotted while rewatching because we give we were given homework to watch the pilot and then you said, "Oh, I'm going to watch the other three beforehand and i went actually i could do that as well because i went out and just bought the dvd you, like you immediately, did yeah because i thought yeah. sod it i want to do this and it's yeah. it's on now as, we, as we're sat here but yeah, yeah um so in the book uh, hang on there are two versions on the tv series of dirk's expulsion from university now you have to be paying quite a t- good attention to notice that there are two different versions because one of them is the entire hinging point of episode three Yes. Uh, episode, right. Well, yes, episode, the third yeah, episode, the, which is episode one, two. Yeah, yeah. The one, the one at the, the college. Yeah. I was the one with the, the robot. The one yeah. with the robot, yeah. Okay. There's that one, which yeah. I think is possibly my favourite of the series. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right. But that's because I like um, the several of the people in it anyway. But yeah, um, I don't like the last one but the, uh, of the three of the series. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the pilot <clears throat> episode, it's implied that he was basically cheating right yeah right and and that's why he's running from the thing and that's why he knocks over gordon in the car when he yes. does the reverse okay. yes yeah yeah yeah. because it's implied that he's basically cheating now in in yeah. the novel all dirk actually did was he told he faked the clairvoyance yes in order to do what 
any, I think the line is, I did what any ordinary student would do, which was a minimal amount of research, look at past papers and select some questions at random yeah, yeah. and say that was it. Unfortunately, yeah. so had the question setter. Yeah. So he'd predicted randomly using chaos the exact exam. Yes. And that's what he gave to everyone, and that's why he was expelled. But he, yes. he faked the, the clairvoyance in order to trick his roommate into uh, believing that he was you know psychic so that he could then sell these papers and make money because he's a swindler, but he's a clever one. And it was yes. that, that pushed him towards it. So the that's like a third version of why he was... Because in, in this TV one, he says, I am clairvoyant. And he's just seeing it randomly, like, and he talks in his sleep about what's happening in the future. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, in order yeah. to solve crimes, all he really needs to do is buy a dictaphone and then play his tapes back the next day. If that's true, that's pointless. Anyway, so so I yes. think that's yeah, probably yeah. at the core of his character changes that's going on here. The the changes yeah, so made for the, yeah, it does feel very much like we've got different Dirks in every episode. If you watch them all kind of close together. Yeah. Because uh, I was tidying I was tidying my shed the other day yeah. and I put the TV on because it's quite a nicely laid out shed and yeah. I had it playing while I was clearing up. And I, I spotted there was definite character. I wouldn't even say development. There was definite different character takes. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. we're here well, to talk about the pilot. So no, but I th- no, no, no. I think because we, we both watched all of them. So I, mm. I asked my wife if she'd be interested in watching it. Um, and I had forgotten she hasn't read the book. And I'm like, you need to read ah. the books now. Um, and um, we we watched the pilot a few weeks ago, uh, and then we've watched the other three, <clears throat> the other three within the space of the last sort of week, ten days. So the the series itself is more fresh. I've got the pilot on in the background just to remind myself of, Same and it looks yeah. different. It's there's a whole the, the the look of it is different. You know, the director's yeah. different, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, I think the music's great. Here. The music, oh yeah. Well, I've been listening to the soundtrack on Spotify. It's on Spotify if you're interested oh. in listening to the soundtrack. I shall, um, I shall find you. Yeah. So let's talk about writing. So the series was written by the series was created by Howard Overman, who I wasn't really familiar with. I think he wrote the Atlantis for the BBC, which was the thing that replaced Douglas Merlin. is already dead at this point. Yes, yeah, Douglas died in right. two thousand and one, right. and this is okay. twenty ten. So, yeah. so Howard Overman uh, is the sort of executive producer who wrote the pilot and the first episode of the series. Then Matt Jones wrote the second one, which is the guy who wrote the Satan Pit Impossible Planet. Nice. And then Jamie Matheson wrote the third episode, which uh, he'd written for Being Human, and he went on to write two episodes for Peter Capaldi. Yes. Which was Mummy on the Orient Express and Flatline, I think. Hello, future Luke here. It occurred to me as I was editing this that maybe Jamie Matheson had done more than two episodes. So I looked him up and realised he had indeed written The Girl Who Died, along with Stephen Moffat and Oxygen for Peter Capaldi later seasons. So just to add that note in before people write in angry emails. Anyway, back to our conversation. Which are two of my favourites. Which are which are very good. Um, but you didn't like that one. I think that was my least favourite as well. Um, They're all very I, strong. I can't say that, that it was bad. None of this is bad by any stretch of the imagination. I, yes, Its I biggest crime that... is that it's not the books. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I th- and I think I think it sh- it couldn't possibly be partly because no. budget, partly yeah. because what he was given was an hour's pilot. You know, yeah. like and and to take some ideas from the first book, you know, yeah. the time machine being the primary one. Yeah. Um. You know, and we we need to talk about time travel as well. Uh, in a bit. We um, do, and Apple iPhones. But go on. And iPhones. Yeah, yeah. I think that. I like the Howard Overman episodes the best, so the the pilot and then the first one of the series, because I think he does the whole interconnectedness thing, the best. Yes, yes, that's the that's I, the um the the USB stick and the mints that he's constantly yeah, yeah, until yeah. he gets yeah. to the and USB just, stick. Just the fact there's all this there's all this random stuff going on, and I, that first episode of the series is the silliest of the. That I remember, is true. I remember, yeah. I remember getting to the end of that episode and, and saying to Hannah, "This is really silly," and also I'd forgotten. Because I was like, oh yeah, the pilot is loosely based on the book, and then the other three mm. aren't really at all. And I'd forgotten actually you know, that first episode revolves around the software. Yeah. That in the book, was what made Gordon Way a millionaire, and I was like, oh, I'd forgotten that that was actually a kind of major plot point of that yeah. episode. And, and you've got your Wang computers episode... as well, because he's in the Wang Laundry as well. Cause yes. He's downstairs. Yes. There's so many nods. Yes. To that and Hitchhiker's Guide in this, it's 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 an absolute exactly. love letter. Exactly. It really is. Yeah. Um, and then obviously with the second one, you've got St. Seds. 
the fictional St. Seds College is the sort of yeah. the setting for it. Um, so I think perhaps because the final episode is the one that is least connected to the book, yeah, that's perhaps why I didn't enjoy it as much. Um, Although the the ongoing battle with the yeah. oh yeah no the ongoing battle with the cleaner yes I suppose that yeah. is yes you're right that is a big part of the second book isn't it so mm. you know yeah so they all draw on from on element from elements from the books yes. and I, yeah I just think I preferred the two first episode the pilot and the episode one because I think Howard Overman did the best at sort of capturing the fun yeah of that's the books. true um, I think I think Mangum gives a really nice performance in in the one with the robot yes. because his relationship with Max is makes him the most human so human that they have to spoil it at the end they have to yes. they have to turn they have to turn the knife to reset his character yes because yes. you're going oh he's all right and then you find out no he's not he's, he's no. a scumbag he's still, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's still yes. as bad as he was at the beginning spending all of the money but yeah sorry J- Jill yeah. Jason Watkins now I've got a, a tiny little Jason Watkins side story come back to it it's very sad okay uh, and uh, nope I said that far too upbeat okay so I've got a new job still in the NHS but you have to do mandatory training one of the mandatory training videos is about sepsis okay yeah. trust me this is going in a weird place but it, it no, bear I, with me one of his children do, do you know where of, this is I, exactly one of his died of sepsis yeah, yeah. And, it's, and the day I, the day before I watched this Blu-ray, well, not Blu-ray. I haven't got a Blu-ray. God, if it only existed on Blu-ray. No, before I start watch these episodes, I was watching Jason Watkins talk about the death of his daughter through yeah. sepsis. It's a sepsis awareness video. Yeah. So I'd just seen someone who I really like, who uh, is in lots of great stuff, and has never put in a bad performance, as far as no. I can tell. He's brilliant. Uh, and and then he was just telling this this incredible, heartbreaking story about his real life. Yeah. And I'd watched him in that, and I was like, "No, Jace, this is—it's too real. It's too real now." And then I'm going under this, and I'm like, "It's about this. I don't know if even if it's about the same time, because he's—I—I I, I got the dates wrong, and I didn't want to work it out. I didn't want to yeah, go. Yeah. Oh my God, this is what's in your head at the same time that this is happening. Jesus, you're good to be able yeah. to just." get on with go to work so yeah, anyway yeah. so that was it so that was my i had a double he- helping of watkins that day yeah and yeah he's great he's underused he's he's massive no, he's, he's massive massively underused as is helen baxendale you know, that's my go- next if you're point, going to yeah, cast she's... helen baxendale yeah i mean user. she's she's not in episode one and three she's just in the pilot and episode two yeah. um my helen so i have a helen baxendale story it's a oh, very please, short. Please. Helen, so it's short. It's a, it's a Helen Baxendale. Even if it's a long one, I don't care. Tell no, it. No, it's a Helen Baxendale slash Nick Briggs story. Mm. Um, so when I was studying in Oxford, so that would have been around about this time actually. So yeah. it would have been a similar time to that she'd been in this, and I was doing my final film. So that would have been towards the back end of twenty eleven. So yeah, so somewhere in this time, um, and I had a really small part in the film I was making for uh, a mother to one of the main characters, and she's literally in one scene. And I just thought, what the hey? And I don't know why I thought of her. Possibly, it might have even possibly been because of this actually that I thought she would work. So I got in. I found her, got the details of her agent. I emailed her agent and said, look, I'm doing this student film. Would Helen Baxendale be interested? I know why it was. Somehow I discovered that she lived close to Oxford. That was it. I don't know how I knew that. Somehow I knew that she lived close to Oxford. So anyway, and I got a very nice email back from the agent basically saying, no, she's not interested. But there you go. That's my Helen Baxendale story. Um, <clears throat> I've at least contacted her agent about her appearing in a film for me. Um, anyway, um, and then I Where's thought, well... Nick there's Brie? Oh, go on. Sure, go on. <laughs> well, anyway, more. so then I thought, then I thought mm-hmm. there's no reason for this part to be the mother, you know. It just has to be the parent of the character yeah for the for the purposes of the scene it has to be the parent of the character and i just thought well i don't know i'll rewrite it as a bloke and i sent it to nick briggs yeah because i had met nick briggs briefly in a pub while he was filming the extras for the android invasion because that was near where always I lived. a good place to meet nick yeah and i went and ambushed them and i got to hold the boom mic and i'm on the credits for the dvd extras of the android invasion and i got the dvd for free and it was in a box set with invasion of the dinosaurs so yes yeah thank you ed, thank you ed stradling um Anyway, so anyway, um, so I had uh, somehow I had Nick Briggs's contact details. Anyway, I emailed him and said, "Look, I've got this really small part. Would you be the dad in my student film?" And he said, "I'm really sorry. I'm playing Sherlock Holmes in theatre in Nottingham, but if I was if I was free, I would do it." 
Nice. So I nearly had Nick Briggs play the dance. Anyway, in the end, I got a lady, a local amateur actor, actress through some website, and she was very good. She came along for the afternoon, filmed this scene, and, you know, was great. Um, so I didn't get a famous person in my film, but I tried. Um, but yes, so Helen Baxnil, for, for someone as famous as she is, you know, she was in Friends, for goodness sake. She yeah. is woefully underused in this. She's very good. She just is woefully underused. Yeah, she's... And, and um, Boyd was in everything at this time. Like, you couldn't shift for seeing him in stuff. He was definitely flavour of the day at around this time. What else was so, he in? Because I... Well, I... No, I, I remember seeing him in loads of stuff. I'm Cause, gonna, I, cause right, like, so... he, did, he's, he didn't do Doctor Who, because he's not on my Doctor Who... No, he's not on mine either. Watch, uh, uh, list. Yeah, it, it actually uh, says in my notes, surprisingly... Uh, not well, apparently he has done a big finish neither. well Mangan keeps coming up as the possible doctor you know he's one of those standard wheel him out oh he's never been the doctor kind of people to play the part yeah but he's too um, obvious now yeah so yeah. you know so uh, we won't discuss um, who's been in what yet because that's not important yeah, we'll, we're still, we'll in, the, we're still the in the actual episode so yes um, Shall we? F- so we need to focus on this actual pilot, which is you know why we're here. We're we're forty odd minutes in, and yeah, we have to yes. focus on the actual pilot. Well, okay, let's so, focus on the actual. So pilot. so time wise, okay for me, it's what twenty ten December. So it's Christmas twenty ten. Yeah. Okay, so uh, V's born in two thousand nine in January, so she's not quite two. So as you will know, as another parent, when you've got a child of this age. You're going to bed early so you don't wake up any children. Right. And you are watching a lot of TV because you're knackered. Yeah. So that's why I ended up watching this on radio, on BBC4 when it was on. Uh, I have a distinct memory of being in bed watching it on the... Well, I would say a portable, but it, it wasn't a portable. It was the, it was quite a big TV. Yeah. And uh, But I remember watching that because... And, then, and um, because of the way my wor- world works... Uh, Tin Dog Podcast number 157. I'm now up to 1,300. But number 157, I actually recorded a review of this at the time. Yeah, and you sent it to me and I've listened and, to and it. I've, you have listened to it because I was yeah. like, no, there's no need. But uh, uh, I've, A, one thing, uh, my pronunciation is nicer then. Uh, my diction's better. But also, um, I I do agree with many of the things I said at that time as well. Yes. <laughs> I even bothered to put a, a trailer in from the actual BBC advert and I don't know how I did that but that's nice so yeah I was I enjoyed it then as well which was nice I, I was good quite pleased about that but yeah well so the I, I suppose I should say the reason we're doing it now hmm. is because I have this pile on my desk which I've told you about many times called my shelf of shame and it's things that I've bought that I haven't got around to watching and I looked this up on my Amazon account the other day and I told you didn't I that oh yeah yeah I bought so I bought it in May 2022 so it's been sitting there for two years which I I thought to be honest I thought it had been there for longer um because I was like well, I yeah. watched this at the time I remembered it being good I was like the DVD is available I'll buy it and I'll rewatch it and then I just didn't get around to it and I thought this podcast is a perfect excuse to kind of go back to it so let's do well, it no, I'm I'm over I'm really pleased I'm also really pleased that you suggested it because I got it off eBay for like two quid well there you go and and I was just over the moon I've thoroughly enjoyed it uh, it um, took some time to so, get around to watching it, but it, yeah, yeah. So I was, so you were a relatively new parent. I yep. was in Oxford. I, in fact, I just moved to Oxford. So I started my course in Oxford in September 2010. Yeah, and I finished in February 2012. So basically, the the the, the, the series proper came out just after I finished my course, and the pilot <laughs> happened just as I was kind of living there. But I lived in Bristol immediately before moving to Oxford. And this was shot in Bristol. Right. So it's standing in for London, but, you know. Um, so, um... Oh, I will ask so, you yeah, Bristol-based I, questions another time. Well, no, so I... So the one thing that stuck... That pinged in my head, and it was a thang, thing of, like, did this ping in my head at the time? The fish and chip shop, which was called yeah. Pembroke Fish Bar. Yes. Must have been a proper fish and chip shop, you know. They didn't have the budget to kind of mock one up. It must have been like, we need to location scout a fish and chip shop. We're going to pick that one. Mm. And I, I've i Googled it. It doesn't appear to exist in Bristol anymore. <clears throat> but obviously it's, you know, it's a long time. Um, yeah, yeah. But I I distinctly remember, it pinged in my head as like, did I know that fish and chip shop? And I don't know whether that was just me kind of remembering watching it the first time around. But my feeling was that I knew where that was. 
but I couldn't tell you now because it's been well 14 years since I lived in Bristol um but yeah, and there are bits of it where I go, yes, this does look like Bristol. But they did take a lot of... I read about it and they were like, we were trying to kind of make sure that we were picking bits of Bristol that didn't look obviously Bristol because they were trying to make it look like London. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so there's that. Um. But yeah, so I guess that was a fun part of it for me was like, I I literally just moved away from the place where they shot it. Um. So I was I probably was so more sort of on the inverse, board going. Um, uh, location scouting kind of thing. Yes. Yes, and I suppose it's like obviously, like when they did Doctor Who in Sheffield, and I was able to go. Well, that bit's in Sheffield. That bit's not in Sheffield. You know. No, yeah, <laughs> I was definitely. Probably, I was probably able to watch it gently and go. Well, yes, I can tell that this is in Bristol because I, you know, used to live there. Um, less so, as I say, less so this time round because you know it's been a long time since I lived in Bristol. So no, fair enough. Um, but that was a that was a that was a fun aspect to it. Um, can we talk time travel? No, of course we can. Um, so I'm going to link. In the show notes, I'm gonna. I meant to send to you, to you this before, but I forgot. I'm gonna link in the show notes to a video from a YouTube channel called Minute Physics, because mm-hmm. he does a great job in about three or four minutes of explaining the different types of time travel in fiction. Can I just stop you there? Yeah. I only got one straight A while I was at university, right. just the one, and it was for an essay on all of the different types of time travel in fiction. Oh, okay. Right, okay. and that was that was that, my, that was my only first that I got for anything. Okay, so would you agree that the way that time travel works in this story is the same way that time travel works in the third Harry Potter book and the first Terminator film? In the sense that it is a closed it, loop. Yes, in the sense that the way that time travel works in this is if you go back in time you don't change anything, you become part of already established events. So But so, do you cause so, the, the do you cause the events or not? Yes, that would be well, no, no, fair because it's, because the whole thing is like the cat and Gordon Way go back in time. Yes. The cat becomes what her, she thinks is her original yeah. cat, but is yeah. actually the older version of her yeah. future cat. And Gordon Way dies because she kills him. Yes. As being a witness to her killing her husband. Yes. Um so but he always went back in time and died, and the cat yes. always went back in time and became the other cat. Right? There was no change going back in time and changing yeah. things. So the the thing that causes all of this really is Gordon's fixation on work and Dirk reversing over him. Because yes. if does Dirk doesn't do that, then the relationship could be saved, then Gordon wouldn't have to build the time machine and yeah. so on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. And she would have. She. Uh, the late yeah. old lady would never. I, have I can had go a, for closed The loop. old lady yeah. would never have had a cat. Yeah. Because her future yeah. cat would never have gone back in time to become her old cat. Yes. Ah, and she now. would. But she would possibly never have killed her husband because That's, she only killed her husband because question, yeah. he was mean to the cat. Yeah. Although so that it's was all probably kind of, the last straw. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. You, you think she, pro- she would have probably killed her husband for some other reason because he was a horrible yeah. bugger. Um, yes. But if she yes. didn't kill her husband at that specific space time event, on that time, Gordon, even if he did travel back in time, wouldn't have. But then the cat wouldn't. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. So. Um, yes. Actually, no, 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 no. Because obviously the cat. He must. He the husband was mean to a different cat, wasn't he? Because obviously, the future cat only just yeah, arrived back in time of, at that point. Because yes. otherwise, she's become ridiculously attached to a cat that arrived two minutes earlier. Because I think the only thing that Gordon does, oh no, he takes the flowers with him. So he steps from the time machine in order to go and find uh, this Susan. woman who's at least Susan, who's ten years younger than him at this point. Because it's the older. Well, yeah, I know. Gordon. I know. I know. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, it's but it's, it's so yes, I'm, yes, that that's fine, yeah. But anyway, so I'm just I'm going to link to, I'm going to link to the video because I think there's a really good it's a really good and I'll send it to you as well. But it's a really mm. good explanation of the different ways that time travel works in in fiction because obviously there's there's lots of different ways of, of time travel working. Yeah. Obviously in the book, it works differently in that they go back in time and change things. Yes. Um, and Reg reveals that the reason that the dodo died out was because he was too busy saving the coelacanth. Yeah. You know, uh, and in the original timeline, Kublai Khan uh, has Kublai Khan is a longer poem. Is a much longer. Then... See, I, I wish I'd known that. That made me feel really upset 
when just the light there's just one line and it and at the end it finishes Kublai Khan and then the next line in the, the Admiral's book is and then they began the considerably more stranger second part yes. of the poem yes and I I just went oh yeah fair enough because I'm thick and don't know the poem yes if I'd I didn't known know the that poem, at the time yeah, yeah I would have gone what second part of the poem yes exactly and, and that the, the caller at Porlock is just comedy genius now ah yes so uh Oh, hang on. What's he called? Adam from Staggering Stories. Yes. He's got this thing that he once said, and he once said that um, that Douglas Adams becomes a better novelist, but becomes less funny as he gets older. And oh, interesting. The argu- and the argument could definitely be made for that because he really does become a much finer craftsman at the writing. But there's there's no belly laughs. There's no somebody going, "Oh, I see what you've done there." Or oh, it, it's they're incredibly well constructed. I know that Adams is supposed to write uh, like on the cuff as almost as performance art, okay? But I can't see how this novel could exist without a thousand post-it notes and lines on a wall and and diagrams and all sorts of going. Oh, what about this? We'll have this here or this here or this here, and yeah. this can reflect this. Yeah. That that comes from rewrites. That comes from somebody polishing it. That yeah. comes from a lot of editing, yes. and a lot of throwing yourself into something in order to yes. make it construction. Because this isn't. There's not just time travel, like you said. There's this. There's the sofa bit. There's yeah. the, the dodos is beautiful, and I love the way that Cronotus, you well Reg uses the time machine mainly as a video recorder. Yes, be, he, because he can't work the video recorder, but yes. he can work his time machine, and that's possibly the most Doctor Who thing about it. Yes. Well, and just the but, fact that... the, You know, in the same way we were talking about the adaptation. Yeah. You know, this all happens because Dirk drove over the... Gordon Way yeah, on the way he, to he Susan. Re- yeah. The reason that the whole electric monk happens and kills Gordon Way is because yeah. Reg wants to cheer up a little girl, and so he has to go... And he gets a tan, and therefore he needs to put some powder on his face that makes him look like he hasn't been anywhere. So he goes yeah. to the planet where the powder is, and mm-hmm. the, the electric monk gets into his time machine. You know, it's one of those things where the first time you read it, you're just like, "How? How the heck does all this stuff yeah. come together? And why is it all? Why is it all happening?" And then at the end, you're just like, well, "It's really elegantly put together. Like there isn't yeah. there isn't anybody in there who shouldn't be there. Like they're all there for the same ultimately and for it, the same and reason. It's, it's been written to look effortless. Yes. Because yeah. because the, your Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one straight narrative. Yes, it, and, and obviously with the, with the first radio series in particular, they're just yeah. making it up as they go along. Well, yeah. They're they just like, we've got to get to a cliffhanger, and then they're like, right, well, now we have to resolve the cliffhanger, and we've got a few weeks... And in the case of the last episode, what is it? They were literally running it across town yeah, that's to inc- get it to the broadcast. You know, I because can't they... believe that. That's <clears throat> incredible. And just it, wrong. But it, but, but it, it worked. It worked. It worked. So and well. I, like I say, I love that. I love those final two episodes of series one mm. of the radio series. Yeah. With with the Hagin and on stuff more than I love what he later rewrote it as. You know. Yeah. And the, but the B arc and then obviously the B arc. Yeah. The gets planet of Fintle Woodlewicks, all of that business. Yeah, I yeah. do like. I sometimes want to rename the Earth Fintle Woodlewicks as well, just to <laughs> just because it's just nice. Do right. people want fire that can be inserted <laughs> nasally? I've written in my notes lots of other stuff, like why I didn't like Stephen Mangan, and I didn't okay. forgive him. I know this is ridiculous. This is this is parallel with you don't like Bonnie Langford because you'd seen her in Just William. It's that okay. kind of level, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, right. it's petty and it's pointless. He was the second regenerated Adrian Moore on TV, oh. and I and I didn't forgive him for that because I liked the first one. Oh, you see, I've never seen Adrian Mole. Oh no, you you were you were like two. Oh yes, I am aware you, though because yeah. it's in all the reference books that the guy mm. from Hit Greatest Show in the Galaxy is yeah. Adrian Mole. Exactly, yeah. But I I didn't know that. I just thought he looked like him, and I um I really I was very fond of that first series of Adrian Mole because I'd loved the right. book. Because me and right. my grandma read the book together, like between us, we read it at the same time, and we just used to right. Could, so that that was just a nice thing we had. And yeah. uh, and then Mangan comes in later and replaces him for cons- considerably later on as well. So yeah, I hadn't yeah. really forgiven him, and I'd never watched Green Wing, which is weird because it should be right up my street. Um, See, I never watched Green Wing, but I did watch episodes. Ah, yes, 
of which course is the thing did. with him and Tamsin Gregg and Matt LeBlanc, yeah. which was... I'm not sure I ever saw the final series. It seemed to get increasingly crude. Um, Fair and enough. And I, I have a kind of a tolerance for crude that is a lot higher than my parents, certainly. Yeah. But, but still, it's not you know, this, yeah. there's okay. a point where you go, okay, that's just unnecessary. But it was right. very, very funny. Okay. So um, and on, so I on, liked him in that. On my notes, and I'm just glancing at them now, my, my thing that I need to mention is that I've got the words written, frog on a chair. And I don't know why I've written frog on a chair. And if anyone wants to tell me why I've written frog on a chair, please feel free to put it in well, the you know, uh, comments. I mean, you know, the frog on the chair presumably is a reference to that Jodie Whittaker episode of Doctor Who. That's what I'm thinking. But I don't know why I've written it because these notes were written a few weeks ago. Yeah, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely sure how that relates to this no, episode. I, of I'm Dirt looking Gently. at my notes going, I've got this. The child at the school, the one in the book goes, well, it's bleeding obvious, mate. He's got a time machine. He's got a time machine. Right? <laughs> and he solves the problem for him, right? Yes. Uh, but it, there's a, so there's the child in the schools in this. It's the same child, quite clearly, because that seems great. But that's obviously missing from the storyline. Yes. There you are. Right. Yes. So we've talked about time travel. Now my problem then, because you've listened to my review from <laughs> ages ago, and now was the same problem with the whole episode. She realizes that there might be something going on with the time travel aspect when she finds Gordon's phone in the old lady's stuff and plays the recorded message she sent to Gordon on his phone. The iPhone has been in a box for the best part of a decade and the battery's still live. Oh, yes. I mean, that is the most preposterous part of the whole thing. Literally, I'd believe time travel in front of an iPhone battery lasting more than a week. Yeah. More, more than two days, to be honest. Yes. Um, so... That that is. I mean, my, there is the also the question issue. of like what the heck she thought it was. True, because she would have had no idea what it was, and you kind of think, well, did she never wonder where he came from? And I, I, mean, I suppose she just murdered him and her husband, so you know, perhaps it was, you know, perhaps it was just a case of I just have to get rid of this and forget about it because it's such a traumatic so thing did, that I've done. Did she bury the body in the garden? So there's two bodies yes. in the garden. Yes, right. the implication is she buried both bodies in the garden. Um, yeah, and then she yes. kills herself. She kills herself at the end, yeah. yes. That's yes. a very nicely constructed scene where they all drive in very yes. fast to the hospital. Yes. That is yes. beautifully done. Yes, the fact that she tells them yeah. she's poisoned them, but actually she's just getting them out of the way so she can commit suicide. It, it's Yes, it's that is that was very clever. Actually, um, I've just realised something. Okay, sorry. Yes. I was thinking the differences between the books. Okay, The Electric Monk was what I was going to yes. ask you about. Yes. Um, are, are you a fan of The Electric Monk? Or do you just see him because... Oh, I, I think the electric, just, monk, yeah. the electric Monk is hilarious. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I suppose the 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 thing that we haven't talked about, mm-hmm. which does come up in more, I think, episode three, with the okay. whole like con- cons for Jesus, um, is is Adams was an atheist and he was quite yes, um, publicly an atheist and he wrote stuff and and did talks and was about friends with Dawkins, that, the fact that he was an atheist and he, and off the back of. The first Dirt Gently novel, Richard Dawkins became friends with Douglas Adams, and then Douglas Adams introduced Richard Dawkins to Lala Ward. You know, you know. Um, and Apparently, they they're no longer the... together. I don't know. Any they time. separated a few years ago. Yes, did they? I didn't. Um, okay. I, I mean, I, th- yes, I think where Dawkins is at now in the public sphere is quite an interesting place. But the, the, that's another. It's a whole other conversation. He was always an but, evolutionary biologist. But it, but it makes so... me think. It makes me wonder. It's one of those things where I'm like, where would Douglas Adams be? in the public discourse, were he still alive? And I think that is a very interesting question and one that we can't answer because he's dead. But I, I think that's an interesting question. Well, I, because, I think a I lot think of that's I... answered in Salmon of a Doubt because the, the Stephen Fry's introduction where he's talking about Douglas would have loved iPads and things like that, but he would have probably gone, yeah. but I, I invented all of those myself. Yes, so I, I think as yeah. far as the technology goes, he would still yeah. be the Apple nut that he I was. I reckon he'd be working for Apple. I, I reckon just, he'd actually I... be working for Apple. <laughs> I just I'm I would be intrigued as to know where he would stand on where the public discourse about faith and atheism and Christianity and all I wonder where he would be in relation to all of that. Given yeah. where Dawkins is and the fact that he separated from I, I from Lala Ward. I don't know why they're separated, but I wonder whether they just don't see eye to eye on stuff anymore. Um and you just wonder where you wonder where Douglas would be. But but while he was alive, he wrote about his atheism, he was very clear 
that yes. he'd grown up as a he'd grown up as a Christian, as Dawkins did. You know, they have similar mm. stories, and that they got to a point in their teenage years where they were like, "I don't believe this anymore. It, it doesn't make any sense to me." And yeah. obviously, Douglas Adams reading the selfish gene made him kind of go, "Well, I don't, I don't need an ex. I don't. There's a there's a perfectly good scientific explanation here. I don't need God." Yeah. Um. And that sort of that never. I feel that that doesn't come across particularly strongly in his work, and it's partly why I didn't like the Sixth Hitchhiker book because Owen Colfer went proper atheist with the Sixth Hitch the Sixth Hitchhiker book, and there's that sort of paralleled slightly in the Dirk, Dirk Gently TV series in that Dirk is very clearly scientifically minded, and he kind of makes a point of saying, "Well, I'm scientifically minded, therefore I don't have faith in God." He kind of he kind of makes that point. Yes, yeah, he actually you know, says and, those words for word to the to yes. um, the bloke who isn't um, Reg. Yes, um, yeah. and obviously, I, you know me. I think that's bollocks, right? Because because the whole like antagonism between science and faith in God is is manufactured, right? Okay, it, it it's entirely dependent on your philosophy of science and your theology. Okay, and if you kind of bring if you want to bring them into conflict, as people like Richard Dawkins do, you can. Yeah, but you don't ha- you don't have to, right? It's entirely possible to hold those two things together. Um, and if you don't believe me, I filmed some much brainier sciencey sciencey Christian people, which again, um, you know, if you want to, if you want that stuff, it's out there online, you know. Um, my, to be fair, so both arguments be- are out there online. Yeah. It's really not. A my, problem. But basically, my point being, you don't have to. Science and faith don't have to be in conflict, whereas Dirk very clearly believes that they are. Yeah. Um, and and I think I think Adams did. Um, but I, so I just I'd just be intrigued as to kind of in the twenty three years since he's been dead, the where he would be in the public discourse now, based on what he wrote when he was alive. I'm just, it's just it's just an intriguing what if um, that we just yeah, we just no, we will never enough. know. It's very it's very rare. This side of the two thousand, this side of the millennium, it's very rare to come across people who have f- figures in how do I put this figures in the public in domain who have gone from atheist to believer but you do meet people who become believers later in life as they become closer to their life ending and it's easy it, it would be very easy for me and flippant of me as well to say that um they're doing it because they're hedging their bets about where they're going next but that is how it could come across. So as somebody gets... See, he died young, right? I'm yeah. now older than he was when he died. That freaked yeah. me out because I'm still waiting to become famous. And he, <laughs> he'd been... He'd done shed loads before. But no, I'm saying that that was... that You know, it's very sad of me to think still think like that at 52. Um, yeah. But that is a, a personality failing of mine. Because uh, no matter how regarded in the world I would become, I would still f- not feel like I'd achieved very much. But that's just me. Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, his because he died young, he didn't get a chance to 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 get to that point to to, to reconsider whether he needed faith or not in his life. Yeah. I suspect from the things that I've read. And I know he was always going for the joke, so you can never be 100% certain, but I suspect that he would definitely have been still on the side of the atheist, still pushing that whole, um, like like me, still pushing the whole, yeah, religion, it's great, it got us where we are, but uh, the problems it causes, it's not worth it. Because, although that, although we had this conversation before, it's... It's the excuse people are using they're pulling out in order to do the things that they wanted to do, the, the bad things that they had in mind in the first place. It, it's like, this is the badge yes. you're going to wear in order to say, we're in this team, let's behave this way. Yes. And the, yeah, some yeah. people on the same team are going, well, actually, that's not what my team is about, but we're going on the bandwagon as well. So, yes. uh, yeah. So I, I think the, because I think that's what that's what's at the core of the God delusion. If you want to go down that that route, and you can buy the God Delusion as read by Lala Ward. If you want to hear Lala Ward swear, you can buy it on CD and then <laughs> listen to that, and then then get rid of it. So that that's a good way of I, I, hearing Lala I can't, swear. I can't remember whether it was t- it was talking to you on this podcast or not, hmm. 
Um, but I got, I think I got like a page or two into the introduction before throwing it across the room. Not fair enough. Because I was just like, I was just like, you're so wrong in your introduction. I just, I can't, just, I can't, you know. He does get, um, he does get several of his, of his religious um, generalizations a bit too general. Um, but I think, I think, his, I, think, his think I think it was argument I th- does. Well, I think it was just the fact that, that, that like he just, he can't, we're talking about Dawkins now, aren't we? Which is we are, which we can point. Yeah, but, but let's, we'll get. Yeah, but we'll do this my, for two minutes. My fi- basically, my final word on on Dawkins is that I think he's he's so narrow in that he has to see everything through the eyes of his speciality. You know, like that he and and he seems to not have a sense of humour. I think there's a big difference between him and Adams. Is that obviously yeah. Adams has a, Adams had a great sense of humour. Richard Dawkins seems to be entirely lacking in a sense of humour. Right. Um, and that's why I had a lot more time for Adams than I would yeah. ever have okay. for Richard Dawkins. Well, that's it. Somebody um, said, would you rather have a friend who was funny or who was honest all the time? And I was like, it's it's funny. I, I just, I, I need, that is what I need. I need that connection with, yeah. with the company. Anyway, sorry. So yeah, you see, you've got time for Adams, but you've not got time for Dawkins because he's he does well, no, come across I've as got, a bit of a misery. I've got time, and I think we've I've answered our question about Lala Ward. Yeah, <laughs> if, if if he as he gets older, he becomes the miserable old man that many of us are becoming. Um, then I I get that, you know. Um. Anyway, um, do you have any more notes before we go into Spot uh, the Doctor Who actor? Right, I loved. Well, we've already covered the stuff. Um, let me just have a quick shifty. Uh, see. Taking plot, plot points from City of Death was was a bit of a dangerous area for fandom because the people who read Adams would spot that. But taking plot yeah. points from Sharda at that point, perfectly reasonable. Because if you're yeah. going to steal, steal from something that you think at this point isn't going to be seen by anyone or read by anyone. Yeah. Now, it's, it's wrong because as you can, well, on the shelf behind me, I've got Sharda and City of Death. Here in hardback, first editions, just yes. there. Yes. But, the, but he was the, dead by the time those But he's happened. dead. He. He's dead in the gym. Obviously, obviously, is obviously, best. the video of Sharda came out four or five years after. Oh, yeah, the, with the, the little thing. script book that you could get. Yes. the, the VHS. Yeah. But I guess, but yeah, so, I, mean, I guess he must have he must have agreed to that happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you know. Anyway. Uh, right. Um, so so yeah, Dirk Dirk's character is not a nice man. Uh, changeable at best, it, you know, awful at worst. He is, like you said, he was a terrible person. Um, and we didn't get any more. They they decided not to commission any more, even no, though and then by BBC Four standards, it had quite a good audience. Yeah, and they've made the the, the other series, um, uh, which I think is on Netflix, and neither of us have watched it. Well, I now, watched you, the first five did, minutes and decided. And then I watched the first a, five minutes and decided yeah. it wasn't for me. <laughs> well, fair enough, uh, but I don't. I think I put it on and then got sidetracked and did something else. And uh, I, so I, I didn't I read even a get to that point. I read a description of it on Wikipedia, and you kind of—I was just like, "No, that's not Dirk Gently at all." Right. You know, so like he's—he's a—he's a holistic detective because he's kind of some spin-off from a CIA black ops project, and you're just like, "Okay, that you know, it may well be fun, but it's not Dirk Gently." So I'm not, no, I'm fair not gonna, enough. You know, okay, that that makes sense. So yeah, so um, that's where we're at. Okay. Um, yeah, so, all my notes are just repeating stuff like that. So we've either, we've got two things that we always do at this point. Uh, we've got the cast, and we've got what we're doing next time. Yes. Unless so, you've got stuff in your notes. No, that's fine. No, I mean, I don't write notes, remember? I just, I think I've said everything that I want to say. Um, and I'll probably come back and go, oh, we didn't talk about whatever. Um, so, across the four episodes, there are a number of um, Doctor Who people. Um, and uh, there's a Torchwood and a Sarah Jane Adventures one that I threw in for, for, for luck. Um, I, got the t- but- I got the Sarah Jane one. Did you? Okay. Yes. So hit me with hit me with who you spotted in the pilot episode then, Michael. Okay. So Jason Watkins, the wasted actor, uh, he's been in Nightmare in Silver. And well, he's wasted in that as well. <laughs> he certainly is. Completely underused. I think we both agree that's one of the worst episodes of. I Matt can't Smith's believe tenure, it's by right? I can't believe it's by Neil Gaiman. I can't believe no. the Cybermen. I can't believe the bits. It's just. Yeah. It's it's wrong. It could have been fixed so much easier, and just making the Cybermen run was pointless. Yes. And that was where um, that's where it lost me. Go on. Who did you spot from? And Warwick, Sarah Jane, Warwick's then? in that as well, and he, he yes. could have been brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wasted yes. as well. Sorry, yeah. Sarah Jane. It's Doreen Mantle, right? Yes. The woman from One Foot in the Grave. I yes. was convinced, convinced that she was in Doctor Who. I was convinced that she was in 
the episode where Rose loses her face and it's the oh, the wire. Yes. Yeah, you I was thought convinced. that was the Gran. Yes, I did. I thought that was the. But gran the Gran was wasn't. the lady from Fury from the Deep. Yes, there we go. So no, anyway. wasn't her. So, but she was wasn't in surgery. Yeah. I knew she'd yes, done she a was. doctor, but she was in surgery. She was in surgery. Uh, yeah, I think it was either Gorgon. Uh, yeah, I, it I was, is either Gorgon as right, Mrs. Yeah. Randall. Absolutely um, loved Sarah Jane. It was so much better than Doctor Who at the time. So the other two, who I didn't spot at all, um, Alicia Bailey, who was a reporter, so it must have been a very small part, was Isabella in The Vampires of Venice. You know, the daughter that got turned into a yes, vampire. Yes, yes. And then Alex Parry, who was the barman. You know, there's yep. a scene where they go in the pub and he's like, your mate told me you were paying. There's another example of Dirk being mean. Yep. Um, he was Torchwood. in Torchwood Day Torchwood Day One, so yeah, not going to remember him. Now um, I've got one that I don't think you've got. Oh, you okay. Won't well, from the, you won't. You from, will not have this from and the pilot. A uh, hang on, I can't remember. Yes, from the pilot. Go on then. No, you won't have it because it's not your area of expertise. Because it's big finish. Oh yes, no, I did know this. I didn't put him down, ah, but okay, yes, right. but um, you know him from Miles, you know him. You know his dad from other stuff quite clearly. His dad. Yeah. Who's his dad? Uh, the oh, is his dad the... Ian yes. Richardson? Yes. I didn't know that. If you if you put the episode on and just listen, there's a definite thing going on with the voice. I mean, I think I've heard. Did he do stuff for BBV before he yeah. did stuff for Big Finish? Yeah, but yeah, well, he's because I know he's, I know the name Miles Richardson. Max, yes, which is obviously Braxitel from City the Braxitel collection. Yeah, yeah. Bra- 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 there you go. So it, all links back. No, I didn't put him down, but I had come across him in my researches. Um, episode one has two people in it. Episode two has three people in it, and episode three. Oh, has no, you've got it. Hit me with them people. all. We've okay, we've done so, them. So episode one, and, and these are all most episode one and episode three quite small parts. Um, episode two has more substantial parts. Okay. So episode one, Miranda Raisin, who was the fake wife, yes, who got bumped off. He's um, in lots of big finish. She's in lots of big finish. She's in uh, the Sister Boniface mysteries, but she was Tallulah with the very dodgy New York accent in Daleks in Manhattan. You know, sings the big musical number and yeah, is we... in love with the guy who got turned into a pig. Yeah, I'll stick with the big finish if that's all right. Um, and then Colin McFarlane, who was in like Batman Begins and stuff, who was the hypnot- not the hypnotist, the the horoscope dude. Um, he apparently did some alien voices in Voyage of the Damned. No idea. And then he was Moran in Under the Lake. So he's one of the dudes that got turned into a ghost. Yeah, he's in, in lots of under things. The, he's in lots of things. Yeah, you see him everywhere. You're like, oh, it's him again. Um, episode two. I mean, you you, you you can give me episode two. Oh, you know on. who Epis- you know who it is episode in episode two. The, well, I've got with all the, I've with got, the, all with I've got pro- is Miranda isn't. Oh no, no, that was episode one. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. You mean no? So, uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, idiot. It's the commander of the ship that's landing in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, on, yes. Yes. Uh, great automated heaps. He's also in Alveda's in Pet Series 2 as the main villain, well, Ali Fraser. And he's he's and also in Series 4 of Hitchhikers as yes. the guy who drives the truck, who's the rain god. True. And he's... Uh, but hang on. There was a really, really important one that I can't remember now. Oh, yes. He's also the narrator in... The um the the place where the, the repair shop, he's the voiceover of the oh, repair shop. Okay. Yes, but go on. He's, in Doc- he's yeah. also he's also the lead in another mm-hmm. series that's on my list, which I have been having trouble tracking down. Okay, what what is so, it? So I'm not going to tell you because it will spoil it, 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 it might, for if we eventually be, do okay. it. <clears throat> right. But anyway, yes, Bill Patterson. Bill Patterson. Who was he yeah. in Doctor Who? Oh, I'm clipping myself now. You are going to kick yourself. It's not a very good episode, to be fair. Well, that's not... At the minute, that's not narrowing it down. Um, Telly to be Daleks. Oh, yes, yes. He was... Yes, he was a bomb. He was a, a robot bomb, yes. Yeah. Um, Mark, you could have fixed that so easily. Sorry. You could have. Um, the other two... Sylvester Latuzel, who is in everything... Um, she's the she was the female scientist Imelda Ransom, you know the one that created. Max. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, her very oh. first, her very first acting role, where yep. she is credited as Sylvester Latozel, 
rather than Latuzel, okay. is one of the children in the Mind Robber. You know the no. ones that. Yes. Do you not know this? No. Yeah. 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 I'm very impressed. If you go back and watch that, you can tell which one she is. It's been a while, but I think I will. But you need to go watch that. That uh, I think it's in episode. Oh no, I'm in, like, very impressed and, by that. Yeah. I am. Um, I, I just knew. I've always known that she was in that. Um, okay. And then the other one, I I didn't spot this guy at all. Um, Andrew Leung, who was Noel, who was pretending to be the oh, other yeah. guy. Yeah. He was Doctor Chang in Dark Water, and I haven't rewatched that episode of Peter Capaldi, so I don't remember him at all. Right. Um. And then, right, we are really scraping the barrel with episode three. So, <laughs> hold on to your horses. Tina Maskell, who was the cleaner, yeah, uh, was a stunt performer in Boomtown and The Runaway Bride. Yes, of course she was. Poss- I'm assuming maybe doing stunts for Catherine Tate. You know, they're a similar build. Mm. Okay. And then, this one doesn't really count... Um, I'm only oh, putting like, it in because <laughs> I, I'm only putting it in because he he had a credit on the Dirt Gently episode, and he was playing essentially the same character in Doctor Who, um, but uncredited in Doctor Who. So Jason Stevens, who was who was credited as Heavy One, nice because he was the heavy that spoke. You yeah. know, there isn't actually credit for Heavy Two because Heavy Two was the other guy who didn't say anything, and he was an uncredited thug in the Idiot's Lantern. <laughs> Nice. So of course we wouldn't have spotted him. So anyway, that's yeah. that's the whole of that's the whole lot. Well, there you go. That um, is marvelous. So, um, we've had we've had a sort of extended episode we because have. we needed we needed to talk about the books and the, the adaptation. We um, have, and so we've I probably hope... missed a lot out. Well, well, there's so much more that could be. I mean, if we'd done the book properly, with there's so oh, much yeah. more to be said about the book. Um, and we haven't really talked about the second book at all. No, no. Um, but I love I love them both. Um. So, this was July. Um, so, by the time you hear this, you'll all have finished Doctor Who. I still won't have. I mean, you know, I will eventually watch the series. In two weeks' time from when this goes out, I will be at the Standby for Action 2 concert Ooh, in Birmingham, nice. um, which which is going to be presented by John Culshaw, and we'll have a live new bit of Stingray to kick off their kind of... 60th anniversary Stingray celebrations. So oh. if you are if you're at Birmingham, uh, whatever it's called, the the, the music venue in Birmingham. Uh, if you're at that gig, if you're at that gig, come and say hello if you can spot me. Um, you know, you'll be the person um, who looks like you. Yep. Yes, I, and I think I'll probably be wearing the Keith Ford Rocks t-shirt or my or my Shadow t-shirt, one of the two. You know, nice. Um, and hopefully I did I tidy my wardrobe have... out the other day, and my wife went. So that t-shirt there went. Yeah, I'm keeping that one. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that's that's that, and then you and I are both going to be at Hooverville. Oh god, yeah. At the at the end of August, and we still haven't decided what we're doing, but we'll announce what we're going to do in August. It'll be in August podcast. I su- suspect we'll be drinking tea. And we'll be doing something. Um, yeah. But that leads on to what are we going to be doing in August podcast? Because it's your turn, Michael. Oh, to choose. it's my turn. God, August already. Right, I'm going to do it. It's the single most. Oh no! Do- it's the single oh, wow. most okay. Doctor Who adjacent program ever made. Wow! It's Blake Seven. Now I was racking my brains, going right, Blake Seven. I want to do it. You've not seen it. No, I have. You have seen it. All I've right, seen I thought- it all. I've seen it all once about fifteen years ago. Smashing! Right, so it's it's coming. I was of the. Opinion that you'd missed it or something. Anyway, right. I mean, I was way, obviously too young first time round, but yes, yes I well, caught up with I it. I wasn't. Uh, I caught I up with it on DVD uh, probably when I was living in Bristol, actually. Right. Or well, sometime okay. in that ballpark of my life. Uh, I was going to go episode one and two. Oh, okay. That introduces practically everyone and the ship. Okay. Um, because if it's just episode one, all you've got is a week of misery. And if it's episode two, you've got a week of misery and hope. Uh, that was yes. that was where you kind of do need to watch them back yeah. to back, don't well, you? Basically, basically, you need to watch the first three episodes because then you're like set and you've had yeah. Brian. But so you're I going was... for like introing it rather than picking your favourite well, yeah, later because in the series it, because that was I was racking my brains, but that was the mistake I made with Star Cops. I That's went true. straight to the end. You did, and that was pants. So I thought, no, I'll I'll overcorrect. 
and we'll go, <laughs> we'll go for the first. And we'll go for the first two Blake Sevens. <laughs> okay. Right, because okay. it is. We need to get it out of the way because there are other things on my list that you know I want to introduce to you that I know for a fact you've not seen. Yeah. Um. And there are things that I've rewatched and I've thought I'll put them on the list that I might possibly have removed from the list because I don't want to. Sh- sh- I don't want to have them as for your consideration. Oh, but, there are some definite question marks on my list. Yeah, the question marks are growing on mine. So yes. anyway, I was fairly safe with Blake Seven. I also know that our beloved and probably attractive listeners would actually, you know, kind of want to embrace Blake, Blake Seven a bit. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's go for it. Let's go. Let's, let's, episode okay, let's one, do and Blake episode Seven. two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't have them, so you're going to have to send oh, me copies I've, of those episodes it's, to. It's, uh, I've got to a two. Watch. I've got two copies of the de- first DVD. I will send you the first DVD again. I don't know how I've got an extra disc one, so oh, okay. I shall send you my cool. disc one. It is because I'm a skinflint, the Dutch version, because <laughs> I I couldn't afford. I could not afford the proper DVDs when they came out, and I thought, here's me. I'll hedge my bets. I'll buy these, and. Um, and then I'll wait for the Blu-ray. So as we all sit round quietly waiting for the Blu-rays to eventually <laughs> arrive, after all these decades, when Blu-rays probably aren't being made anymore, wow. we're going to do it. So yeah, I will send you the disc. Not a problem. Okay. Well, I I look forward to doing Black Seven when we record sometime in July to be released. Sometime in, in July, God knows when, because it's been yes. seven weeks. Because it. Like yes, said, well, yes, we're recording. The, we're recording this one very late in the day, and I've got an insane weekend next weekend. So I've got to find some time to edit this. In I the next don't few mind days. if it if it's a bit late. It's fine. It's by fine. Me. No, it will go out on the first of July. Um, yes. Ish. Anyway, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I'm it glad has. I, I'm glad I chose it. I'm glad we've watched it. I'm glad that my wife was able to join me watching yes. this one because she doesn't usually join in, but we had a good time, um, which is why I've been able to watch the whole series yeah. rather than just the one episode um, and I'm glad you enjoyed it too so I will say farewell and I will leave the final word as ever to your good self until next time be seeing you <laughs> <laughs>